the free, um, okay, there you go. So this uh, meetup session is also going to be recorded. So if uh, you know you want to catch some more content later, uh, by all means, uh, we'll probably post this on YouTube. Uh, so we'll also share those links out at the end. But um, for all new folks that are just joining right now, I'm Nick. I'll be kind of the MC today, doing the quick introductions uh, for our speaker tonight, but also kind of giving some context on what General Assembly is up to, what is product hired up to. And then we're going to get straight to the talk that we are all looking forward to, which is what are product hiring managers looking for. So let's just do a quick, uh, quick kind of overview. And Rajesh is going to give us that talk in, in a few minutes. So we did some of our networking right now. We'll go through some sponsors, some introductions, some housekeeping, and then uh, Rajesh is going to give us our uh, meet of the the talk tonight. Um, our two sponsors are Product Hired and General Assembly. And uh, Brianna, I'm going to let you speak more about General Assembly. So uh, feel free to chime in. Awesome. Thank you all so much. Um, for those of you just joining, my name is Brianna and I manage events and workshops at General Assembly. Um, General Assembly is a global tech education company focused on the most in-demand skills, primarily within business data design and technology. And our mission is to empower individuals to do what they love. And we do that in a few different ways. We offer full-time, sorry, like immersive full-time courses for those looking to change careers. We have part-time courses for those looking to level up. And we have short form workshops and free community events like this one, currently 100% online, but we are hoping to uh, start running more in-person um, tentatively in August. So um, I really hope if you're in the Austin area that we can see you soon. We have a lot of stuff coming up at GA. Um, I will drop the link in the chat, but it's ga.co slash education um, for our full upcoming uh, schedule. Later this month, um, starting next week, we have our Pride Summit. Um, later in June on the 16th, we are um, collaborating with Product Hired on how to get promoted to a director of product uh, session. And then at the end of June, we have Marketing Week, and that's a full week of free events and panels and um, workshops uh, all around branding, marketing, uh, digital marketing, all the things that fall in between there. And those are all free, completely open to the public. Um, and then we have a couple workshops uh, coming up. I thought that one would that would be really exciting for this group would be a two day product design boot camp, but we also have um, we also have project management boot camps. We have product um, product management boot camps and um, a bunch of others that we run on a very regular basis. So definitely check out uh, the link that I'll drop in the chat in a minute. And uh, if you have any questions, let me know. Um, definitely jot down that uh, code. We don't offer fifty percent off. Uh, very often, but we have that bootcamp 50 code for you um, if you're interested in joining any of the paid uh, classes. Nice. Thank you, Brianna. Um, Thanks and for having me. Thank you. Um, and in terms of Product Hired, so um, Mark and myself are co-founders of Product Hired. Um, what is Product Hired? Basically, it's a place where it's essentially a career resource for your um, career, for lack of better wording. Uh, what we offer here is interesting in that you can start, you know, finding certain jobs based on certain criteria. So if you're looking into, let's say, product management, or you're looking into, for example, uh, product design, uh, product marketing, product ownership, um, these are all listed fields on our site. So, you know, if you are looking for a job, definitely take a look at that. Um, if you need some help with career guidance, right, or if you need help with interview prep, you know, you're wanting to break into product management or anything of that nature, uh, by all means, find a mentor, right? Uh, these mentors, we have close to 50 right now on our site. Uh, they're here to help you and you just need to book a session with them. Um, and they're readily available when you can kind of, uh, you know, fit, find, a, find, a, find a time slot and you can kind of get matched that way. But this is what they offer. And again, free or paid. Um, if you are, let's say more seasoned and more experienced and you want to contribute to the community, by all means, you can become a coach. Um, it's free to sign up to be a coach and then, uh, you know, by all means, uh, you can kind of start promoting some of your services and work on the different social networks. These are some of our current coaches. So a lot of them are here actually in the Austin area. You got William, who's more for design. Cindy, who's also for design. Dan Corbin uh, from HEB. 
um, he can definitely help with product management related tasks. So by all means, uh, if you know somebody who wants to be a coach, this is the link uh, to make it happen. Um, so what is Product Hire Job Club? Uh, basically, it's a place where you can network, you can experience coaching, find jobs, talent, and you know, learn how to find jobs and get better at interviewing. Um, but really, what it really is about is we're trying to create a community that is kind of more, I guess there's more synergies and much more, um, I guess Mark has a better way of explaining these, but um, you want a community that is well connected and we have let's say not just um, trying to think of a good word here, but uh, you, you want people to be connected and not let's say be part of some type of bubble and things that let's say might happen, for example, in certain tech uh, ecosystems like Silicon Valley. What we're trying to do here is be much more open, much more collaborative and kind of allow the community to build and foster that type of relationship where in other communities, you know, there might be less of that. What we're trying to do here with Product Hard Job Club and here in Austin in particular is get those relationships going. So that's our kind of mission and prerogative for Product Hard Job Club. More community focused, let's help one another out. Let's be more, uh, you know, respectful to each other and learn and grow. Um, really who this is for is again, if you are in tech, primarily in, in product management, product marketing, right? User researchers, data analysts, data scientists, really kind of on the non-technical side or some technical aspects, I think with data scientists, but um, that's really who it's for. And I think uh, kind of going forward uh, with what are the many different activities that we're doing with the job club is, uh, we're really trying to kind of build that community and ecosystem, not just here in Austin, but kind of share it out into the world. And so every single meetup that we do uh, host and provide, um, there's a link on YouTube that's being sent through these uh, recordings that we do. And so you'll be able to see all of our previous sessions if you've missed them. And if you want to kind of learn extra things, whether it's product focus or, um, you know, design focus, you can go to our channel and see all that. Um, again, if you want to kind of see more updates and if you can't make a meetup, uh, you can subscribe to the channel and, you know, get kind of those notifications for the next um, set of meetups that we do host. So look at that. Definitely a big repo of knowledge and content. Um, I'll kind of speed through this because I want to get to uh, Rajesh talking, but we do have a few upcoming events. Oh, well, actually, I hit the slides. We'll talk about these after. I want to kind of get to the future presentation. So, uh, Rajesh, I'll let you kind of take it from here and uh, kind of explain to us what hiring managers are looking for. So, uh, feel free to share your screen and uh, we'll get started from there. Okay, awesome. Nick, thank you. And Brianna, thank you to, to General Assembly for, for sponsoring. Um, I did build a bunch of buffer into this, so Nick will have plenty of time to come back and, and talk about uh, upcoming events towards the end as well. Uh, all right, let me pull up my screen. Can everyone see the deck? Okay, awesome. I am going to uh, just open up the window. If you guys want to leave your video on, that's great. It's helpful for me. Just I'll, I'll have it. I have it on the other screen. So it feels a little bit more like a regular uh, talk, but if not, don't worry. It's no big deal. Um, cool. So, uh, you know, excited to be here today. I wanted to give a quick intro about who I am, um, talk about what I look for kind of at a high level. And then, uh, you know, I have a kind of a normal hiring process. And so I wanted to talk about at each phase what I'm normally looking for. Um, and uh, Colby, I know, probably is about to get on a plane, but he was kind enough to, to volunteer uh, last week to do a mock interview. So I'm going to play the recording uh, and then we'll do a quick debrief on sort of like anything you took away from that, either the things that I was doing or the things that that Colby was doing. Uh, and I'll, I'll leave some time at the end for questions. And um, I'll also try to pause between each of these major sections to see if there's anything that's kind of top of mind for y'all. If you do want to, uh, let me just open the chat too. So if you want to throw your questions in the chat, um, I'll do my best to, to keep an eye on that as well. So with that, uh, let me tell you all a little bit about myself, kind of super high level. Uh, I've been doing product management for more than 16 years. Um, in mostly at, at startups, but also at a couple of larger companies. Um, I've worked at six startups and three of them have exited one IPO and a couple of acquisitions. 
Uh, during that time, kind of overall my career, I hired about 15 people. Um, and this number is about to go up. I'm currently helping a, a few clients recruit. And what that means in the, in the last probably two, year and a half or two years, I've looked at 2,000 product resumes and probably phone screened 150 or 200 people. Um, and so, you know, I wanted to share some of the things that I'm normally looking for as a part of my process just to help help you all, uh, you know, make any career transitions or, or get that job that you're looking for. So. Um, you know, wanted to cover at a high level what I'm what I'm typically looking for. I think of there's kind of like five big things that product managers will bring to the team. Um, three of them are what we what I would call a craft skill. So one is strategic planning, and I'm going to do a deep dive on all of these things. Uh, by the way, for those of you who are taking notes, please do. I will share the deck afterwards, and I know the recording is going on as well, but uh, you'll you'll get a copy of the deck, so you don't don't feel like you need to write everything down. Uh, the next one is customer journey skills. Uh, so this is kind of really about design. Uh, the next category is kind of execution, like just how, to, how does product ship, road mapping, all these things. Uh, there's also a ton of people skills, right? Product sits at the middle of many uh, teams, sales, marketing, engineering, design, execs, customers, users. Uh, and so there's a lot of collaboration. There's a lot of really important people skills there. Um, and the last one's kind of hard to evaluate. Uh, and, and I'll talk a little bit about this, but uh, there's certain mindsets that we look for uh, in product managers, and, and we, we work with a lot of startups, and so it's often kind of something that's very specific to startups, but I also help recruit at uh, larger organizations, and you know, there's certain things that we're looking for depending on the role of the culture. Uh, let's do a deep dive on each one of these. I'll start with the craft skills. So, you know, that first craft skill I mentioned was strategic planning. This is basically kind of the big picture stuff, right? So do you have a deep understanding of the customer or user outcomes? This is, you can think of this, uh, you may hear about this spoken about the problem space. Uh, do you understand the market? And I think this breaks down into a few different categories, right? Can you size and estimate how many people might be part of this market? Uh, can you identify trends and can you identify the competition? Uh, somewhat related to all of this is also sort of like the financial and pricing side of things, right? Like as an, you know, at the product executive level, do you understand how, you know, the PL, the margins, the profitability, uh, do you understand how pricing, uh, what levers you have to pull and, and connecting pricing to value and, and those types of things from your customer and your user's perspective? Uh, vision and strategy, and this is a place where we spend a lot of time working with uh, our clients on like, where's the product going, how are you going to get there, uh, and, and to, to a certain extent, kind of uh, competitive differentiation, how, why is your product going to win out there? Uh, another really big one is sort of goal setting and KPIs, thinking about what are the right metrics to know if my product is even on track, if we're doing well, if we're not, those types of things. Uh, and the last thing here is just experiencing every sort of part of the product life cycle. So from like, inception to launch to like finding product market fit to scaling a product to make sure as many people as possible have access to it and, and get it in their hands to managing a mature product um, and, and probably at some point even sunsetting a product right there's a lot of different skill sets that come at, at the different life cycle stages and obviously at different levels of product managers we're looking for di different amounts of experience um, but those are the high level strategic planning skills the next category is what what i had sort of called customer journey it's a lot of UX and visual design, and I think that's sort of at the core of it. Um, when we talk about you know, customer journey in the framework that we use, which is called vision-led product management, we think of the six, there's six chapters of the customer journey, and that as a product manager, you need to think holistically about that experience, not just from the moment they log into your app or from the moment they start using your feature, like that's where a lot of product teams start, but really customer journey starts way earlier than that, right? So there's a triggering moment where they're banging their head against the wall, wishing there was a better way to accomplish outcome X in their life. Uh, there's a discovery process. And obviously, you know, marketing plays a big role here of making sure that people are aware that our product exists in the world. There's an evaluation phase where they're looking at the product once they hear about it. And they're, they've got something going on in their head that they're trying to decide, does this thing look pretty good? Does it look like it helped me achieve my outcome better than the existing solutions out there or whatever I'm using today? Often that leads to a trial. And I, I don't mean like trial in the context of free trial, but you know, with a lot of products, you kick the tires, right? Think about how many apps you've downloaded on your phone that just sit there on the home screen or like mine are just like on some other like screen that I'd never even see them. Obviously, the goal then would be to go from trial to usage, and this is where a lot of product teams focus their effort, which is like, how do I activate a user on day one and then keep them engaged with our product for an ongoing basis? 
Um, and then it kind of comes full circle, right? At some point they may fall out of love with your product. And it's really important to understand what are those triggers that prompt them to think about even switching products and why do they stick with us or, or not, right? And so I think these are important parts of the customer experience that we expect product managers to look, uh, look for and know about. Um, kind of very closely related to discovery and evaluation is product marketing, right? How are we positioned? How do we separate ourselves from the pack and what's unique and valuable or interesting about the way we do product or our solution uh, as it relates to, to others in the market? Uh, this is the last one that we put in there. You know, uh, I worked at a couple startups and we used a lot of behavioral science and the way we did product. And uh, I think it's a, a sort of valuable uh, technique and tool tool set in the sort of like overall toolkit for product managers, which is understanding that people are not rational beings and there's a lot of emotion built up in how we act and whether we click on a button or not. And so um, obviously there, there aren't a lot of people who have this, but I think it's something we call out because it's a very powerful skill set to have, um, especially trying to figure out how to nudge consumers. And I think Sorry, more specifically, if you're operating a, a product that has, you know, large numbers of consumers, I think it's a really interesting uh, skill set to have because you need to be able to change behavior at scale. Uh, the last set of category was sort of the execution side of things. Uh, so this is kind of the more tactical thing. So being able to do customer research and that may take you know, a couple of flavors, one might be like kind of high level generative research, understanding the, you know, outcomes or the existing solutions, the competitive landscape, it may be more evaluative. So thinking about usability testing, those types of things um, often becomes relevant at, at smaller organizations. Uh, feedback management, it is no joke to think about how to collect either qualitative or quantitative feedback and organize it and synthesize it and prioritize it and decide what to do with it and then like get it back into the development process. Whole set of skills uh, related to that. Technical understanding, you know, being able to know what's feasible, what's not, how does my product work, what's the tech stack, what's our tech debt, what implementation choices were made either historically or about to be made that'll affect sort of, you know, usability or, you know, business strategy going forward, those types of things. Road mapping in this one hopefully isn't surprising, kind of the idea of creating some pathway and explaining what the priorities are going to be, what types of things will be delivered over some time period. And like, not always in so super specific sort of project style for timelines, but, um, you know, even, uh, I'm sorry, um, even broad strokes, right? This quarter, next quarter, next year, like those are good things. And that's, that's the starting point of a roadmap. Uh, the product development process. So, you know, especially when you're early in your career, you're focused on shipping great experiences. And there's a, a skill set in collaborating with design and engineering in particular, thinking about agile uh, loops and optimizing those processes, you know, making them better and more efficient. Um, and, and those are important things. And like, you know, ultimately you'd be judged on whether the, the process is generating valuable insights or like sort of value for the customer and the business. Uh, time management is one that we put on here because <laughs> we talk about this with our clients so much. I think the classic example here is, wow, I really want to do more customer discovery or research, but I don't know how to make time for it. Uh, and that was the session that I did last week on sort of like best practices. But this is often a root cause of why sort of more customer research doesn't happen, right? And so I think it's a really important skill for product managers to have perhaps not surprising kind of underline all of these things is like really the core of product management is prioritizing, prioritizing problems, prioritizing solutions, prioritizing personas, prioritizing like competitors, like all those things, right? Prioritizing your time, those things. So um, let me just pause there and see if anyone has questions about any of these kind of craft skills as we call them. Okay, no worries. I'll pause again in a minute. So if you have something, uh, throw it in the chat. Um, so that next category of you know things that, that we talked about is kind of in the fourth category. It was more about people skills. So you know, I think one of the biggest ones is listening, and this is just you know beyond hey, I heard what you said, but more around like I I heard what you said, and I, I think I understand, uh, or I want to dig deeper to understand what you're really trying to accomplish. And this is not like oh, I, I got the feature request and I'm a good listener because I heard it, um, but really trying to understand like why they're trying to do that, why do they think that's the right solution, those types of things. 
Um, you know, communicating, obviously, this takes the, the two main flavors, the you know, verbal communication, you collaborate with a ton of people. I think written communication is becoming even more important as we're moving to more like kind of remote or distributed teams and everything's happening over Slack or email or Miro or whatever it is that you're using, right? And I think this is becoming a, an interesting skill to, to test for. Uh, collaboration, as I mentioned, you know, if you were going to draw the sort of like hub and spoke model, like typically product would sit in the middle of lots of different functions across the organization, uh, whether it's you're trying to like collaborate with sales and make the sale or demo the product to close a deal, debating with them on what the right priority of features are and whether we should build things for like one off requests or not, those types of things, to customer success and maintaining relationships. And then there's always this sort of trifecta of design, engineering, and product, which has lots of complex complexities built into it and, and nuances. Um, uh, of course, cost collaborating with customers and, and you know being good partners to them and, and users as well. Building trust, and I think this is a really important one for product managers uh, because there's often no kind of direct reporting relationships and, you know, product managers often sit at a place of high leverage in the organization. They might be controlling or prioritizing the time for like five or six engineers who are like the most ex kind of expensive people who work at a company, right? Um, and so there, there's a lot of trust that, that needs to be built that you're thinking about the sort of customer and the business in the right way, that you're doing what you say you're going to do when you say you're going to do it. Um, and honestly, I, I sometimes feel that Gantt chart roadmaps is like the, the quickest way to unravel trust because they're often wrong and poor product people get caught up in sort of like the, the crossfire because they got up and said that, you know, feature X would be delivered by June and here we are in June and they have to deliver bad news. And I think that this is like an example where I think trust erodes fast for, for product managers. Um, empathizing, and I think this is important not only internally to understand what is sales, what's going on with sales. Like, can you imagine your whole paycheck and your family's like livelihood is dependent on your ability to sell this product? And here, this product manager is saying like, "No, I'm not going to build that thing." And just you know, thinking about it, I think obviously a more even more important one is also like the, the customer empathy, having a deep understanding of what what is your customer dealing with in their life. Where does your product fit in the sort of like grand scheme of things? It's probably not very high for most products, uh, and having that context and empathy. And I think that one that's sort of connected here that we often kind of combine between listening and empathizing is like almost like emotional intelligence, like being able to read a room and adjust your, your communications or like, you know, um, message accordingly to the sort of like reactions or feedback that you're observing. Uh, leadership, and I think this happens at every level of product management. Uh, like I said, most product managers don't have designers or engineers reporting to them. They're trying to convince other people on other teams that this is the right set of priorities, this is the right problem to solve, now's the right time to solve it, this is the right solution. Uh, and hopefully they're doing that in a collaborative way, but but sometimes there is, you know, they, they have to take a stance and hopefully often they're, they're sort of emerging as the thought leader and, and the person that a lot of people turn to uh, when tough decisions need to be made. Uh, th these last two kind of come down into a little bit more of like at the, you know, director level up, just, you know, the ability to hire great people, whether it's a product person or a designer. Sometimes people, you know, participate a lot in the, the engineering hiring process or other, other folks. Uh, and then, of course, once you recruited a person to, to sort of like managing them and helping the people on your team grow in their careers and help them hit the sort of like milestones they want to by delivering immense value through the product, right? Through to their to your customers, to the business and all those things. So um, let me pause here and just see if there's any questions on the people skills side of things. Okay, no worries. Um, all right, so this last category of things that, that you know, I'm looking for at a high level is mindset. Um, and there's a handful of things that I'm really looking for here, right? So one is adaptability. Things are always going to go wrong. Um, and as a product manager, you kind of got to roll with the punches, right? So I'm looking for, can you uh, adapt to, you know, market conditions changing like COVID last year or competitors launching a product and sales now saying that it's a real threat and those types of things, right? So how quickly can you adapt and, and how much does it throw you off? Um, similarly, tenacity. Never going to be a shortage of roadblocks in product development or customer discovery that sort of preclude you from being able to do what you think is the right thing to do. Um, and, you know, we're looking for people who know how to, to sort of like fight through those and um, 
you know, like I said, we, we recruit a lot at startups and this is incre incredibly important there because things will change and uh, you're taking up a roster spot at a company that doesn't have a lot of money to like pay a lot of people, right? And so you need to be able to, to hit some of the goals and, and maybe there's a Herculean effort that's necessary to do that. Curiosity, and I think you can kind of categorize this as like a growth mindset, right? That you're always wondering about the customers or the users or the market or the technology competition that you're just constantly trying to learn and better yourself so that you can make better product decisions uh, and build the right thing for your customers and, and your business, right? Uh, decisiveness. So like I said, often product people are put in a position where they kind of have to make the final call. And that's fair because hopefully they're also being held accountable for the decisions they're making, right? Or the outcomes that the product is, is uh, delivering. And guess what? You're rarely going to have perfect information. You're never going to have all the data or analytics you're looking for. You're never going to be able to do all the customer discovery that you want to. And you have to be able to make choices off of imperfect information. Uh, and that's like kind of key to the role. This one's somewhat related to sort of tenacity, but I think this one's really about, you know, responsibilities about, I feel like I have, am, am ultimately responsible for the success of this product and I'm going to go do anything that's necessary to make sure that it is successful in the market. And hopefully, you know, the team has defined the right metrics so that there's an objective view to that, but there's also sometimes a subjective view to that as well. Um, and this last one's sort of around passion. Uh, you know, do you care about what you're working on? And I think this is, you know, like I said, super important when we're recruiting at a startup. And I think it continues on as companies get bigger. Like, you know, this passion doesn't die down. It's like the founders are still there probably. Uh, and hard product's a hard job. And one of the things that it's going to get you through the ups and downs is, is like whether you really care about the mission of the company or the people that you're helping and how it's affecting their, how your product is helping their lives and those types of things. And so uh, these are the kind of high level categories that, that we're looking for. So I'll pause again and just see if there's any questions on kind of the, the big picture. Those are the five categories that we talked about. There was a question actually by Brooke. So the question is, what is the best example you have had of someone displaying in an interview that they have mindset qualities? Great question, Brooke. So um, these are things that, that, you know, I look for honestly at every single phase of, of this and, and we'll do a deep dive here in a minute. But, um, you know, I'm gonna throw out an example here of just some of them, right? Adaptability. So sometimes if I if I feel like this is actually a really big thing, then, you know, I tailor the phone screen to make sure that I'm pressure testing for this. And I'll ask something like, tell me about a time where something surprised you and how you responded to it, right? Um, and th th this is where I'm testing for how adapted were you and like, were you able to respond or, or not? Um, and, and sometimes it's pretty clear in the answer, like that they just weren't and they, they might have a story around it uh, or they don't. You know, like they can tell if they, you know, they've, they've been through this or not. Um, res responsibility, honestly, that one kind of comes through naturally and in lots of answers to these questions. And this is just like, you know, it's sort of like second nature for me now, having done so many screens. Um, you know, I want someone who's going to kind of like talk through the, the sort of hurdles that they did go through and tell me the story about why they kept going. And this is where passion also comes through, right? I really cared about, you know, these customers and I felt like this was the right thing for us to be building. Even though the first version didn't work, we kept iterating and here's what happened, right? Those types of things. Um, so hopefully that's helpful, Brooke. Um, and, but if not, we, I'm happy to answer, answer more. I, I think maybe the next section might be helpful too, just to talk about like kind of what I'm looking for at these different stages of the, the, pro, in the kind of hiring process. Uh, this is Sina. I really liked the list. It's intense. Uh, so my question was like, how much of this are you looking in a resume before you even take it to the short listing? Yeah, great question. Um, and it's a great segue. Um, mindset, I, you, you know, as you might imagine, you really can't test for that in the, the resume or the application, right? At, at that point, I'm looking at... Um, some of mostly craft skills, especially the written communications, but I'm also looking for like, you know, obviously one of the trends right now is sort of the transition to becoming more outcome oriented. Well, it's really easy for me to tell how outcome oriented you are because I can tell whether you're listing a bunch of bullet points of the tasks you did in your job or whether you listed the bullet points of the outcomes you delivered as a result of doing the task. And that's like a really simple example where these things come through really quickly for me having looked at, you know, as many resumes. And so I think um, the mindset, it's, it's hard and honestly, 
I'm going to talk about in a minute sort of the process we use. We always do a homework assignment after the phone screen. And one of the reasons we do the homework assignment is it's one of the fastest and most efficient ways on both sides to get a better sense of people's mindset. Um, because we ask questions that are realistic situations that they're going to face in the first few months in the role. And we quickly get a sense for how they would approach the problem and, and those types of things. So um, I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit more now. Cool. Um, okay. So, uh, you know, the question was, what am I looking for in the application phase? So, okay, so there's four phases. Um, I look at the application, I do a phone screen, there's a homework assignment, and usually it goes straight to final rounds. And final rounds may vary by the organization, but it's usually like who you might expect. At a startup, it might be mostly execs. At a larger organization, it might be the design engineering team for sure. Uh, you know, maybe marketing or sales or some other people that, that just to test on the collaboration side, but that's kind of the, the high level process. Um, so in the application phase, look, I'm going to talk about cover letters, and I think maybe the point I'll make here, because I believe a lot of you are trying to transition into the role of product management, is I believe you should definitely do them if you're trying to transition. Um, it, but keep things, it's, it's a risky business, I guess, is what I'll say. It is literally the first impression I have of you typically, right? It's the first thing that pulls up in most, you know, applicant tracking systems because it's like it typically precedes the, the resume. It's the first thing I go look for was, is there a cover letter because I want to get a sense for, for the story. Um, and so my, my, my recommendations here is to tailor it to every role. To be honest, I think it's worse to have a generic cover letter than to have no cover letter at all, because it clearly sends a signal to me on how much you actually like read about this role. And I think one of the issues I find these days is like, you know, the likes of LinkedIn and Indeed have made it so easy to apply for a job that, that you know, it's it just, I don't see the passion coming through, right? It's not clear to me why this role is exciting to you or interesting to you. But I think if you're trying to transition, the cover letter is really important to show how the things you've done in the past are relevant to this kind of current role. And one of the things I, um, you know, I mentor Texas McCombs MBAs who are looking to transition into product. And so I was telling them about like one of the most effective things I saw in a cover letter was a table that showed the job description. And then right next to it, it was like, here's the experience I've had related to these, like, you know, a handful of the bullet points. And it wasn't like the entire job description, but they pulled out like two or three things and they were calling it out. And it was like really efficient and effective for me when I was kind of looking over the cover letter to quickly identify like, oh, this person does have the experience. Even though when I go back and look at the job titles and the resume, I may not have gathered that as well. Um, so like I said, one of the biggest craft skills I'm looking for here is written communication. So context, context, context means I want to know that you can explain context, especially in a written format. So like the tip I'd offer here is don't assume that every single person knows every single company in the world. Like put a one sentence blurb about what that company did, like who they sold to, what kind of product it was. It takes me forever to go to LinkedIn and figure out whether this like company is even relevant to the role or whether this person has worked in the industry or not. And so sometimes those are things that I'm looking for. Uh, brevity, you know, I talk about this sort of high bandwidth concept, which is, you know, can you can you communicate efficiently and effectively and can you have like, you know, one or two line bullet points or have you worked for two years and have like two pages for every single year that you've worked, which is like kind of a, a yellow flag for me on written communication in this process, I'm also looking for sort of the career path and trajectory. So like one of the first things I normally do is I scan the resume really quickly at what are the sort of like job titles. And I actually start at the bottom usually because most people put their most like kind of for all this experience there. And I work my way up and I'm trying to get a sense for like, what is this person's like path been? Because sometimes people have zigzagged and that's totally fine. I get it, especially for like kind of um, entry level product roles. People have made a lot of different paths. Nobody go into college for product management. I know that much for sure. And so there's a lot of different pathways in there. Um, and so I'm looking for that. Um, this next one might seem weird, but in certain instances, I'm actually looking at the design and this, this is most common when you're applying to a consumer facing product role, right? So if I look at your resume and like, I can't find things or it's super hard to read, or it's clear to me that you try to jam, like change the margins and jam as much information in as possible, it sends a signal to me. And th this is a little bit more tailored. Like I said, at startups, oftentimes the first product person also wears the designer hat because uh, there's no designer. And so this is another way for me to kind of pressure test uh, on that skill set. Uh, relevant experience. So, you know, obviously the thing I'm doing here uh, is just saying, what are the key things that, that we did uh, that we were looking for from this role? Um, we, I often, I, I always prioritize sort of the top two or three skills or experiences that I'm looking for. And I'm doing a quick, you know, scan as I read the bullets to know 
is this person showing experience in those key areas? Uh, because you know, there's a, the list of must-haves and nice-to-haves that gets pretty long with a lot of roles. Uh, and so that's kind of a key thing. Company stage, you know, like I said, startup experience sometimes is relevant and important because startups operate drastically different than um, the uh, than, than enterprise companies. And so sometimes that matters. And then, like I said, do you kind of have that outcome orientation? And I, I can tell pretty quickly whether, you know, if there's no metrics on your bullet points, then I know that you're you're not probably a very quantitative person. Uh, and that may not matter for me, or it may matter a lot, uh, depending on the role that I'm hiring for. Uh, this last one is sort of LinkedIn. So um, I often do go to LinkedIn. I'll be honest, sometimes it's just easier to read LinkedIn than resumes because the format's always the same. Uh, and it's easy to, to click on company names and I can go see what the company does. And so I'm looking at the match, the matching. Um, if I see the titles changed on LinkedIn from the resume, sometimes it'll raise a yellow flag, especially if it looks like there was some title inflation going on on the resume. Um, Sometimes depending on what type of what level of role I'm looking for sort of like, you know, have you been in some flavor of product for, for some time? And I don't mean product management specifically, you know, product people cover a lot of backgrounds, but have you been around product development and, and SaaS or software businesses for a while? And uh, I'll be honest, I often look at, at who I know in common with someone by the time I get to their LinkedIn profile. And if it's someone I know really well, I'll immediately send a quick quick uh, question to them and just be like, hey, this person applied to this role. Obviously not if they work at the same same company as you, uh, but uh, you know, if, if you're if you kind of uh, not, I'll just quickly send a, 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 a message and usually in, in the next day or so, I find out whether or that person uh, you know, would recommend them, if, they, if, they, if they're good, strong, those types of things. Uh, let me just pause here because you know I just want to make sure we have some some time. Any questions on sort of the phone screen or sort of the application uh, that what I'm looking for there? So can you talk a little bit more about um, the have you been around product and um, if you're a product person? You know, obviously most of us here are transitioning from some other field, and so I think being able to describe that well and concisely is going to be important. Yeah, sorry. And just to be clear, like this is something I'm normally looking at for more senior roles. So um, senior PM and up is usually where I'd say like, has this person at least been a product manager before? Because if not, then I've, you know, generally what I found is people have no idea what to expect in the role. And so they, they can't operate at a senior level if that's the thing that the company needs. Um, so that's kind of what I meant. Like I said, at the sort of associate product manager or even product manager role, um, this becomes way less relevant. So, you know, it, it's helpful to see because, you know, people come from everything. They come from design, they come from research, they come from marketing, come from sales, they come from customer success, and they come from engineering. They're, they're like all over the place, right? Um, so th this becomes a little bit less relevant um, at, at some of the, the earlier stage roles. Okay, cool. Uh, so the next step, as I mentioned, the process is normally a phone screen. Um, so the types of things I'm looking for here, obviously verbal communication, um, but let's get more specific. Uh, tell me about yourself. Again, do you have a concise story? Can you give me your sort of background and overview in, in two minutes? Uh, sometimes I'm baffled, like I'll schedule a 30 minute phone screen and someone literally will spend 15 or 16 minutes like with their background. And it's just like, you know, and I, I do my best to share, share the agenda beforehand. But um, so kind of looking for brevity here, as well as, um, you know, passion and interest. And there's, you know, one of the questions I'll ask, and you'll see this during the sort of like mock interview, sort of like, well, why was this role exciting to you? And I can immediately tell whether someone has done their research or not. And that's like a good signal for me on passion and interest. You didn't just click the button and like click a hundred buttons last week. So, uh, you know, a really big thing for me is storytelling and, and being able to, to understand uh, why certain things, you know, why you did what you did. Think about it this way every sort of step of the recruiting process is intended to provide hopefully information in both directions, right? Obviously the hiring company gets a lot more information from the candidate than the candidate may get from the, the hiring company. But I'm looking for information that I couldn't get from LinkedIn or your resume or your cover letter, right? So like the storytelling and the aspects of sort of like, these were the inflection points in my career. Here's why I went to this company or took this job afterwards. Here's why I went back to school. All that's really helpful and interesting for me to understand sort of the story. 
And like we said, sometimes the mindset comes through here um, and uh, I'm happy to provide more details on here. This is a little bit of like a, there's an art here on sort of like being able to brush your test for mindset. Uh, it, some of it's science and some of it's just like gut instinct and, and being able to like see some, some clues at the surface. Okay, like I said, so the next thing that I do after the phone screen, if it goes well enough, is ask someone to complete a short homework assignment. Um, I, I don't know if this has come up or if y'all have gone through this topic before. Um, sometimes we get pushback and ask, a lot of people ask questions on what, why, we, why we do this. Um, you know, I, I think of it as, as like kind of bi-directional information sharing, right? Number one, when we write the homework assignments, they're always tailored to be realistic. This isn't an assignment like, tell me how many tennis balls you think will fit in the Empire State Building, right? It's not a consulting case interview. I'm trying to help you see the types of things you're going to face immediately and when you start in this role, and I'm trying to understand how you'd approach those things. So that's usually what, what we're tailored around, and we, we try to time box the, the homework as well to, to like one, two hours, something, something like that. So there's usually only one question, two questions, and it's usually just like your opinion on something, um, and, and it's not not like you know produce a product strategy or anything like that um so you know one of the, as we talked about there's a few categories of things that i'm looking for here mindset and so i think the thing that you know you should think about here is if you do get the case study or the homework what what do you stand for what is your product philosophy and how do you kind of help help that show shine through when you think about your response um, I also think that a lot of people have done a good job just being like, hey, like I did time boxes. I spent like an hour on this assignment. And so often some of the best responses I get is like, yeah, I didn't have enough time to do X, Y, and Z, but at least they called out, this is my normal philosophy or process. And I just didn't get time to do it. Uh, similarly, on the process side, telling us like kind of what, you know, how would you approach this problem? What are some of the first things you do? Um, showing your work to the extent you can, just help, help me understand what you do. Uh, you know, sometimes people go crazy, like, you know, we'll ask a question just to like, look at the landing page and provide some feedback. They'll go to friends and family and do five usability tests and like summarize the findings from that. And so like, you know, obviously it gets, uh, you know, it's an interesting signal for me, but, uh, you know, I don't put a lot of weight in how much time someone spends in it. Uh, communication, again, think of this as another sort of data point in the way that engineers go through coding exercises and designers have portfolio reviews, like this is the analogous point for a product person is like one more data point that helps us understand kind of how you, how you operate. And so think about the content that you're about to submit. Um, you know, oftentimes I think it's helpful to, to like kind of sleep on it if you're going to send it the next day, just look at it with fresh set of eyes. Uh, proofread, please. Like, I can't tell you how many times I've gotten a homework where the first sentence just had like, it was like illegible. I like, you didn't even understand it because there was like, you know, typos or it was clear that it was half a thought that didn't get finished. So, you know, take a look at it. Uh, and then, you know, I think sometimes you have to make some assumptions about what's in scope or what's not, what's going on in the market. Uh, do your best to just document any assumptions. Like this is actually one of the most critical skills as a product manager as well, right? When you start working with design and engineering, you're going to have to tell them like, here's what I think we should work on. Here's why. And like the rationalization of it is a really important part of this too. Uh, you know, when, when you get the assignment, I think you, you go back to the set of craft skills and think about why was this the assignment that they chose? What are they really trying to test for here? Uh, and how can I best showcase that? Uh, and, you know, that's kind of the second bullet here. Uh, so, uh, I'll pause there and just see if there's any questions on, on homework. Um, yeah, okay, sorry, Shannon, I see, I would love to connect with, okay, Shannon, great. Um, definitely, I'll, I'll send my LinkedIn as well, would love to connect. Uh, is it inappropriate to ask questions regarding the take, take uh, home assignment? No, um, I don't think so. Uh, like I said, sometimes people make assumptions and they just document them, uh, but sometimes they do ask a few questions back after I assign it. And they're just like, hey, I just wanna clarify, this question was asking about this. Did you mean like kind of broadly, or can you tell me a little bit more about the market? Like I said, you know, I take every answer with a grain of salt because at that point, the only research you, you know, the only information you would have is kind of what's publicly available, plus anything that we might have talked about in our phone screen and maybe anything that you might have gotten from like someone else. So, uh, totally fine to, to ask during the, the process. Uh, I have a question for you actually with regards to the case studies. So in terms of the timeline, sometimes I notice companies will say you should spend maybe no more than two hours or three hours uh, for this particular assignment. Um, kind of from your experience, um, can you notice a difference if let's say someone spends a bit more time or spends a bit less or um, does it really matter how much time a candidate should spend on these assignments or what's your kind of viewpoint on that? 
So um, I can definitely tell how long someone spends on it, uh, but I don't place any weight on it. I, I look more at the content than the polish. And I, I recognize because like, look, people have a ton of things going on in their life. Their job might be busy. They might have family stuff. They might be just traveling. And like, so, you know, I, I, there's a lot of kind of leeway given on the assignment. Um, at the core of it, I'm trying to think about how would, the, how could I, how would this person in the role actually step into this problem or like how would they answer this question when actually given it and like, you know, you, you would do things drastically different if it was part of your full time job than you would if you had like two hours on like two nights to like wrap it up after the kids go to bed or something right. Um, so, you know, I'd say be thoughtful, um, but I don't, I don't look for polish, honestly, I tell people to send it in whatever format they want. Honestly, some of the best ones I've ever gotten back is just like this really long email. It's just like five paragraphs of ex explanations. And some people send back decks that are like nicely formatted. Um, kind of doesn't matter to me, but it, it does help me also. It's a little bit of a pressure test on like the communication skill set, which is like, what is the vehicle you would choose to present this information to someone in this kind of in this context? Um, so, yeah, I think that that's kind of helpful. And like, yeah. So, yeah, thank you. For sure. Okay. Um, so in this final round of interviews, like I said, these are typically like, you know, as a hiring recruiter uh, now with clients, I kind of hand them off to the CEO, the founder, the CTO, um, their colleagues that they'll be working with regularly. And there's a few things I'm looking for here, right? And so typically we'll structure these final round interviews to pressure test for collaboration. And so like, as an example, we like to reuse the homework assignment in the final round interviews. And so if it's anything related to like product development, we'll ask the design engineer engineering team to like do like a mock kickoff or something or a meeting that emulates like that product person actually presenting that information to them so we can test for a collaboration see how they respond to the the crazy questions that engineering or design is always asking product people and those types of things right so it's an, again tended to be very realistic to so get a better sense of how someone would operate in the role um communication so you know again just like looking at this and i think cultural fit kind of fit is part of the two, these two things, which is like, you know, does this person seem like they, they do they exude some of the values that we value as an organization? Um, and then the final one is like, uh, you know, a lot of people do come back with some concerns and hesitation. Sometimes in our process, we'll kind of like address these head on. So like in some instances, I'll be sort of the bad cop and I'll be the final person to interview. I'll get some of the concerns or yellow flags from the team and I'll just ask the candidate like kind of directly like, hey, here's some of the things that, that came back as feedback. How would you kind of address them? And at least then they get a chance to, to talk through them and explain kind of what they were thinking or their rationale. So um, I'll pause there and just see, I'm trying to think about time here. Okay, yeah, I think we're good. Any other questions on sort of like what I'm looking for the different phases of the hiring process? Hey, yeah, on the that last part, is it inappropriate? Sorry, I'm asking, is it inappropriate questions? But if you <laughs> kind of ask that back to the recruiter, like, if is there anything that I didn't clear up for you? Is that okay? No, th that's actually one of my favorite questions because it kind of shows awareness and it's like, hey, like, you know, I want to best put my best foot forward. So I, I get it. I get it. Not every time, or not like regularly, but I, I've heard that one a, a decent number of times and it, I think it's a good one. Thank you. And I have another question actually for you about feedback. So uh, let's say you finish your final round interview. Um, can you reach out to the hiring manager and ask for feedback? So that way you can kind of improve your future sessions or future interviews. So I'd say 100% you should, but you may want to wait until after they've made a decision. Um, just because they may still be in the process of like evaluating other candidates. Um, but I think a hundred percent, if they say, you know what, thank you, but it wasn't a good fit a hundred percent. Now I have heard from lots of candidates th that they're frustrated because they just get nothing and it's kind of ghost. And so like, this is one of the things that I always try to do as a recruiter is like, if I feel like it's not a good fit, I usually just proactively put this sort of like key feedback for that person so they can kind of take that forward to their next role because otherwise it's, it's really hard, right? If you're not doing a lot of mock interviews or something, like it's kind of hard to know what's going well and what's not. Right. Yeah, thank you. Yep. Hi, I do okay. have a question. Yeah, yeah, sorry, yep. No, you're fine. Um, could you delve in more a little bit on the collaboration for the final rounds interview? So what, what would that look like? Is it when you're walking through that case study 
backing up your decisions based on what you've uh, researched or you know why you're making a decision is that the collaboration you're looking for um yeah sorry so let, let's zoom in there's a couple flavors of this so if you came back to the case study and you were doing something where you had to present the case study to like a group of people or you know like design and engineering or something i think the example i would throw out here is the person who stops and says does anyone have any questions about anything that I presented or the rationalization and when it does come up because it will then saying oh like maybe we could brainstorm this together or you can help me understand better and so i'm looking at collaboration there i think sometimes uh there's always the question of like how did you pick this as like you know sometimes we do wireframes for like more design oriented product roles and so we'll, we'll there'll be a pressure test there on sort of like how this how'd you end up with this as sort of the, the flow or the design um and i think sometimes that's the right place especially if you're like talking to the engineer and saying like hey do you want to like kind of get at the whiteboard and jam here together and think about is there a better flow or an easier one to implement and like these are the types of things i'd be looking for from a product manager when it comes to collaboration is like can they talk to their colleagues about the problem space and kind of brainstorm together or the solution space uh, and i think that's like one of the most kind of like frequently exercised muscles there Okay, thank you. Yeah, sure. Okay, so um, I thought it might be interesting to do a mock interview. Uh, nobody volunteered on Slack or anything, but uh, Colby did reach out to me and he was unfortunately had to, had to get on a plane. So we did it on Thursday and recorded it and he said it'd be okay to play it here. Uh, however, I am going to pause this recording so that it's not like permanently available. So like only <laughs> only y'all will get to see this recording. Uh, so what I was going to do is just play it. I think it's about seven minutes long or so, and then we'll do a debrief for a few minutes and just see what, what questions you guys have. So uh, let me pause the uh, yeah. Okay, hold on. This very initial sort of about me description and so on. He went back and touched on those same things again and again in different parts of the, the mock interview. And so in that way, you were able to, um, or I assume you were able to anyways, um, determine that he really, you know, had that experience. He wasn't making it up. It was all, you know, sort of genuine stuff that he had done. Yeah, that's a great one. And I think um, he, he did a good job of sort of painting a picture at a high level and then coming back and telling a lot of stories related to his experiences. I think also another thing that he did really well in is um, he did the research about the role and then he explained his experience from marketplace point of view. So he was already explaining how he's going to provide value for your team as a growth PM. And so it was, it seems almost very easy for you then as a hiring manager to connect the dots and understand the potential value he can provide. So I think that was that was very good. And he was pretty clear and concise with how he communicated. So, um, you know, there, there was no kind of confusion at all. It was very crystal clear. Um, and I think his dialogue was good. Yeah, and so Colby and I debriefed afterwards. And uh, one of the things we talked about was like, his tell me about yourself was actually one of the better ones I've ever heard because he also gave that one sentence overview right away that gave me so much information. I've spent four years at marketplace startups and I was like, well, this is perfect. We were a marketplace startup and you seem like right into the media. I'm like, okay, there's some relevant experience. And then he did a great job of explaining what he did at each of those organizations um, in a very succinct way. So, yeah. Uh, yes, Andre, what are some of the best questions to probe into the real culture? Honestly, one of the favorite ones I get is just like, could you tell me more about the culture? Like how, how does, you know, how does product development work? How, what's the, you know, how does the company culture, what are the values? And so the, the only um, sort of like caution or caveat I'd put on that question in particular is if they've listed their core values and culture on their website, like you could come across looking kind of unprepared or uneducated by asking this question. And I think that's more of a general generalization. One of the reasons I always carve off at least five minutes during a 30 minute phone screen to see what questions someone has is it, it gives me a really good sense of how much prep they've done and how interested they were in this role, right? So like with Colby in this role in particular, it was clear that he had done a lot of research. He knew we got funding. He imagined what could have happened as a, inside of the organization after that. Um, and again, in the same way that I might try to ask questions that I couldn't get answers to from your resume, 
you should be asking questions that there's no way you can, there's no public information around, right? So culture is a great one. Nobody can really like, even if they have it on the website, what I would say is like, oh, I saw these five things on the site, but could you tell me what that means in the reality? And like, what's your favorite part of the culture? I think another good question, Andre, that I like is like, you know, what do you like most about this company? And then what do you like least? And that's like kind of a really good way of getting at both ends of the spectrum. Um, so yeah, and Lainey, um, 100%. Actually, Colby and I talked for a minute afterwards about how honest or open he should be about kind of his current situation. And like, honestly, as a hiring manager, like I get it. We just went through COVID. Things happen. Uh, it's just almost better from my perspective to be honest and open and just be like, you know what? And, and some people I've heard them do it in their sort of like story. They're like, you know what? Uh, we got hit really hard by COVID. And so I got like, oh, a couple months ago. And so I took a little bit of time to kind of regroup. And then um, and, and he had a really good story here, right? he actually said, I was trying, I'm trying to get out of operations and I want to get into product. And so I saw this as the perfect opportunity. Right. Uh, and this is like kind of one of those mindsets, right. It's like, Hey, there's, there's an opportunity here. It's not like, an, you know, it comes across as like, you know, the optimist. I, I thought he had a good amount of passion and, and I felt like I was in the room. He had lots of uh, body language for a call, you know, for, for a call. The, the, the only thing negative I would say was, I would say go out and get a tan a couple hours on the weekend because you'd look really good for a camping site. <laughs> but, but that, yeah, and I think that's it's a good point on, on P Peter with the sort of like passion one, right? For consumer facing products, if you're using it, like nothing sends a song, stronger signal that like you're interested in working at that company, right? Like I'm sure, think about how many people at a hip camp actually go camping every weekend, right? Um, and, and that's, I'm sure part of their culture is that they, they're, you know, I'm sure their mission is something around getting people outside or something. Right. And so, you know, I think they want people who are going to live and breathe that mission too. Um, Alexander, great question. What is the, what are the best questions to ask to weed out a potential toxic manager or work environment? Um, uh, yeah, so, um, I think there's probably a few, like I said, I think one that might be helpful is like, um, what, what do you like least about this job or this company? And I think that's like innocuous enough where you're not gonna like scare them, but you're just like, hey, I'd like, love to get a better sense of the culture. Um, I think there might be some other ones, which is just like, you know, if you were gonna do a retrospective on the organization, what's going well and what could be better or some like another flavor of that. I think the toxic manager one would be really hard to get at, especially if you're doing the interview with the hiring manager. I guess one question you could ask is like, hey, I think I'd be reporting to you. What do you feel like are your strengths and weaknesses as a manager? Uh, and, or could you tell me more about your management style? And I think that's a totally valid question to ask of the hiring manager if you get to them. Um, yeah, sure. Doran, you asked the sort of like million dollar question. <laughs> uh, how do you know some, if a company is actually customer or product oriented? So um, actually, I don't know if for those of you who know Reza here in town, uh, he had started a Twitter thread on this like a month or two ago, and then he was slacking me about so some like some, we were going back and forth over email, I think. Um, I think there's some pretty straightforward questions. So like, look at the customer centric organization. I think an easy question is like, how often do, does customer discovery happen? And if the answer is like, oh, at project kickoff, I think you, you, know, you know that it's like, all right, once in a while, it's better than nothing. Uh, if they say every week we're trying to talk to customers or like, I don't know, there's one company I remember they, they did all hands every Friday or every, and then every two weeks, they like literally brought a customer in during all hands and they had like a fireside chat with the customer. And it's like, okay, that's like a pretty strong signal that they are a customer centric organization because they, they think about bringing the customer perspective inside of their organization often. The product oriented one, I would probably say maybe a good question here is sort of how does product how do product decisions get made? And this one leans a little bit more into also the empowerment question, which is like how empowered are product teams? Is it a top deck command and control type situation where like the execs basically set the roadmap and the product team kind of executes on it? Or, you know, is a product team, um, uh, you know, enable, empowered to kind of stick around and, and like, or make the right choices for what they think is best for customers in the business? Okay, last question. Brooke, would you be able to give any other advice on position leaving a company voluntarily taking some part then re-entering workforce in product preview customer? So like, you know, I think question, Brooke, to your question around like, you know, how do you tell the story about leaving or taking some time off? Um, it's a story. Everyone has a personal sort of need. Honestly, I, I, I just say be honest, right? There, there must be, there's, I'm sure there are totally legit valid reasons to go do what you did and everyone has them. 
what I'm looking for as a hiring manager is can you tell that story and like you know there's something about being authentic and sort of like honest there and um so I, I'd say that's probably my best advice there I don't know if anyone has any other sort of tips on how to like position if you if you did leave a role voluntarily I think obviously just the rationale for it is, is another good one Okay, I know we're at time. Um, I did just want to mention before I send the deck out, there'll be some additional resources. So um, at Proudify, we're, we're recruiting for a lot of roles. Um, I think most relevant probably for this organization is there's a, a product owner role at CreditWise out in, in DC, uh, which is a Capital One product, if anyone's interested. Uh, we also have a ton of uh, blog posts on hiring. This one obviously would be probably one of our most uh, kind of popular ones. Um, there's a template for a product manager resume and it's very outcome oriented because I you know, just got frustrated after seeing thousands of resumes that are really hard to read. Uh, and in case the, the book is helpful, I uh, wrote this last year kind of thinking about, it's about not about hiring, it's about the vision led product management framework that my co-founder and I built. Um, so um, thank you all for joining today and uh, hopefully this was helpful. And uh, you know, of course, uh, oh, I think I did put, the, the back of the deck has my contact information. So if you wanna email me or find me on LinkedIn and ask a question, um, uh, definitely please do. Yeah, yeah. thank you Rajesh uh, so much for uh, speaking and definitely giving your words of wisdom on how we can essentially get hired because I know it's not an easy feat. And in fact, last year I kind of spent a few months looking and. Kind of going through the cycles of you know every single part of the interview to the application to getting on site and it's no easy feat but i think uh, this was very uh enlightening so thank you for sharing and sure. i think and i think just to wrap it up for everyone um, i just kind of want to close off with a few announcements and then uh, we can kind of go with our rest of our day but there are a few events coming up uh, not just with product hire job club but there's a product camp conference coming up and so I think it might be beneficial for some of you, if you are looking to get that mentorship and guidance in product management, um, join us uh, Friday, June 11th for Product Camp Online. We're gonna have some coaches as well as some more senior level PMs explain how coaching can help you succeed. So that's one event. Uh, there's another event that I'm actually hosting. And again, it kind of goes in line with what Rajesh was saying in that you, if you wanna be more successful in your product case study, uh, you should help or come join my session Saturday, June 11th. And I kind of go into a lot of detail in particular case studies I've done last year when I was interviewing for a senior product management role. So uh, by all means, come join that session if you want. So some self-promotion there. Um, and then again, like we said earlier, there's gonna be a how to get promoted to a director of product event. That's gonna be June 16th. Um, Dr. Nancy Lee is going to be explaining how to go about that process. And again, in July 12th, so about a month and a bit from now, how to kind of think like a product manager from uh, HEB's uh, principal PM, Dan Corvin. So he's going to be joining in on that session. Um, so definitely a lot of events coming. Again, if you need coaching and you want to get coaching help on either your resume, your portfolio, interview prep, uh, go to producthire.com slash coaching and, and look at some of the coaches there and book some times. And uh, yeah, I just want to say thank you so much for joining the call. I think, um, you know, it's, it's always good kind of hearing from speakers and also kind of hearing from the community. So very happy that we were all able to do this tonight. Um, again, subscribe to our YouTube channel and don't forget uh, to give us some feedback. I think Brianna posted something in our chat in Zoom. Uh, by all means, give us feedback so that way we can make better events in the future. So thank you again to our sponsors and uh, to everybody uh, here on the call. Have a good evening and uh, yeah, enjoy the rest of the week. So thank you. Thank you, have a good one. Thank you all, take care. Thank take care, you. Everyone. Bye.